Hello everyone and welcome to That Which Sleeps. I'm Joshua Perry from King Dinosaur Games. If you haven't heard about That Which Sleeps in the past, it is a 2D turn-based strategy game where you take on the role of a long sealed away ancient evil who has woken up and wishes to retake the world, which is rightfully his. Unfortunately, you are extremely weak and if anyone attacks you early on, you will lose. The idea here is that you need to take advantage of the world, manipulate and deceive people into doing the fight for you. If you do this, you have a good chance at winning. If you don't, you will probably be sealed away again for another few eons. Let's jump into the game and talk about it some more. So uh, there are a few loading screens um, in the game because we have to do a lot of upfront runtime compilation to make the game run faster when actually running, but it's not too bad. So. Here is your basic scenario screen for the core scenarios. If you're running mods, you will see a different screen that has a list display to make it easier. But if you're running the core, you have these three. So the North Burns, From the Depths, and Empire of Twilight. Each of these also has two supplementary scenarios that goes along with it that's roughly the same size. Uh, the North Burns is going to be the beta testing scenario. You'll be seeing more of that in the future. It involves a clash of cultures, as well as a large orc barons type area, sort of a fantasy staple. Um, from the depths is a bunch of city-states in an archipelago. They actually have a non-aggression non, um, treaty together, so it's hard to get any battles going on, and not to mention even if they did, the, they aren't uh, too strong. So you have to do uh, a lot of subterfuge there, a lot of infiltration. And Empire of Twilight revolves around a... Um, an ancient evil that was not sealed away and that has become an eternal emperor of a kingdom and it's mostly about interacting with the governors each of which has its own interesting AI routine that's trying to better its own interests without getting themselves destroyed by the emperor all right so let's jump into uh, the North Burns this is the new scenario screen it's showing you um, a hand-drawn map of the scenario what we had a problem we had in the past was that people said it was hard to jump into the scenarios. Each of these is hand design, so everything is um, the whole history of the area has been put in place. We have nodes going back for hundreds of years explaining the cultural problems between the two, any treaties they might have, and things like that. So you do need a little bit of background information to actually get in and be able to win the game. So if you click on one of the one of these from below, you'll see it break up an area. So you can see Silaria, Hereldus, and uh, actually the Duchy of Guise is listed as an important area as well. So looking at this, we see traits. Honorable, militaristic, tradition, indomitable. Traits here are not numeric bonuses. It's not saying, you know, militaristic is plus five attack or anything. It's saying this is their AI tendency. They will probably solve a problem by sending the military after it or use otherwise brute force. Tradition tells you that they don't want to change their culture, so they will stick with the culture they have and the cultural traits they have. Honorable means that they will protect their allies, attack those that make them angry, generally be respectable. Indomitable says that if you take over their territory, they'll keep on fighting no matter what. Chivalry, blue, is an ethos. Anything blue is an ethos. So, the ethos sure demands fair treatment of enemies and that slights be answered. Ethoses are special. It's, um, it says this government and the culture respects chivalry so if someone else comes and is chivalric even if they're not of this culture they'll get a big bonus to um their reputation there because of the fact that they respect chivalry now it's not just having the trait of chivalry you also have to do chivalric actions so if someone can say they are chivalric and the game may say that they're being hypocritical which may will make people even hate them more if they like chivalry so looking down here you see the cultural traits and then military specialization is on the right with the king in the middle Against the dark. The people of this nation tell ancient tales of darkness and horror. Plus one security, plus 10% bonus to awareness generation. Those are both bad. Security opposes your infiltration. So every POI they control has plus one security, meaning it will take longer to actually infiltrate. The way this game works is that you can almost always succeed at something. It just takes longer. Time is your enemy. On the right, you see military specializations. They have 11 points. They spend 4 on heavy infantry and 5 on heavy cavalry, which makes sense for them. Uh, special specialization points for the military go up and down over time, depending on the command skills of the, of the king, warlords, generals, institutions, things like that. But they adjust slowly to show that the army is slowly uh, responding to the change in abilities and doctrine. Uh, you can so you can check the nations. Um, king Paris the Fourth, the cautious. 
Um, they provide food to Solaria. It's interesting to take them out. Uh, the Barony of Guise. So it's important to note that Solaria is a feudal monarchy. Feudal monarchies have baronies that are strongly independent. That is unique. Most governments do not have that. Most governments have very strong central control, with the exception of things like empires and republics. So let's go check out the conquerors. These guys uh, came in from the east hundreds of years ago. The Young Protectorate will often come to blows with Silaria at some point. Lord Protector Ivorn is in this. Um, this is important here. You see how there's a different frame. That will tell you either it's a different government or a different race. So you can tell from that frame that this is an elvish nation. Only elves have that frame. And you can also see there in the wilds, there's a minotaur tribe. The square is a minotaur tribe. You can see their units and everything. Uh, the barons is important. So this shape is key because that's an orc horde. A horde is different from an orc tribe. Orc tribes are almost all, always all over the place. You'll see them rise up. You'll see them get knocked down. They're not nations. They're more irritants unless you come and unify them or an orc AI comes and uni unifies them. So think of orc tribes more as portable resources that orc hordes can pick up. Oh, important, this question mark. When we originally made the game, we wanted to go very thematic, like King of Dragon Pass. We wanted to say, give you like, uh, questions, answers, and not tell you what's going to happen, and let you play out and find the differences. But a lot of people said they'd rather see the numbers and break it out, so we did that. Uh, here, it's not that interesting. This is mostly telling you what you can use in this scenario. There's 22 wonders, 25 agents, etc., etc. Um, but if you see this later on and you want to be spoiled, go over it. It will tell you the information so you can make better decisions. If not, don't go near it. All right, the old ones. If you have not heard about Night with Sleeps before, old ones are the key to the game. They are who you play as. They have amazing powers, but you have to use them judiciously. If you use them, even if you use them cautiously, you may expose yourself to people who are looking for you who will come find you and kill you. It's very, it's a very dangerous balancing act between whether or not to use the abilities. So, Baliel, he's kind of our introductory old one, which is why he's the first default selected. He has kind of a get out of jail cards um, type effects. Will over fate. Baliel sees deep into the pools of time. At first you will be limited to merely observing, and that will come to pass, but as you awaken you will be able to twist fate into to your whim. So, what happens here is that his early things is you see random events in the future, like, oh, what, an earthquake's going to happen there in five turns. Great, you can not be there, you can maybe try to get someone to go there if you want them dead. Later on, though, you can use your ancient power to move the earthquake, to make it more intense, or even to target at someone to open up the earth and kill a particular individual. But of course, that's very suspicious. The other ones are Dwelling in Darkness. So, Call of Ravens is a good example of that. Add a Flock of Ravens modifier to the target POI, which grants infiltration. There is no Fog of War in that which sleeps. What we have is infiltration. So you can see everything, but you won't get all the data, the information. If you have infiltration, you'll be able to see like what heroes they're coming through, where they're going, what um, the composition of armies are, and the most important thing, which is getting access to the political screen, so you can see what decisions are being made and possibly change them. And that's what a lot of Baleel's powers are about, is letting you take advantage of the basic mechanics and make it a little easier for you. Um, you can see difficulty easy, game length medium. So let's look at uh, Lemos, Shadow of Creation, the Unyielding Rage. Game length long, difficulty moderate. Very straightforward ability tree called Annihilation. Lemos wants to end the world. He's an example of someone who plays very uniquely. So he wants to end the world completely. And what happens, people will eventually decide they don't want to work with you because you're going to kill them as well, because they're alive. You get the ability to turn them into vampires eventually, so you, or you can just kill them or get rid of them. His base ability, the Dead Linger, one, and you see plus one per trait. So this creates the Restless Dead modifier, or augment an existing one. So, modifiers have the key to how that which sleeps actually works as an emergent game. The modifiers can all interact with each other, they all have events that trigger off one another, modified POI, modified people going through. So Restless Dead is saying, the dead are rising. It also is fed into by other things, so if anything is necromantic, anything spawns Restless Dead, it all goes to this Restless Dead modifier, which gets stronger and stronger. You can add traits to it, so you can make your Restless Dead be energetic and running around so they'll move from POI to POI. You can make them necromantic so they'll drain life from people. You can add all sorts of different traits to them. Uh, his other one is the King Below. So Lemos is meant to be the creator of life, who has been imprisoned and gone mad because they've imprisoned him for eons. So. 
he is essentially, everyone in the world is essentially drawn from Lemos, so these abilities play into that, giving him greater control of the where spirits congregate, so the underworld, broken, um, broken nodes. But um, it also lets him have some pull over people as well, give him a little more infiltration boost. Oh, let's look at Moloch. So, um, let's, so you can see Ancient. Um, so Moloch's important. Moloch was um, the first, I believe, of our backer voted old ones and he was really fun to do because he has a lot of terraforming abilities so um you can see he has a long game he says approximately 230 turns that's a long game for that which sleeps although it's not the longest uh agents starts with three which is low ends with nine which is fine very hard right now he's definitely very hard uh parasite so his corpse festers deep within the earth he creates fetid pools the special thing about Moloch is that he creates pools and tendrils. These things can, if destroyed, lower his ancient power. So he can even go longer than that if people keep driving him back into the earth. But they can be very powerful. The pools act as a focal point for his abilities, but also you can sacrifice people, dip them in, and it will give you benefits. You can also use your tendrils to smash and destroy things later on, going as far as to destroy entire cities. The Savage Allure. So Moloch comes from the time when the, this... Um, world was very jungle and hot and warm and moist and everyone was just walking around waving clubs. He liked it that way and he wants to bring the world back to that point. He has um, atavism tagged abilities which allow him to bring out traits that are historic to cultures and eventually try and regress them all the way back to being primitive. And he does the same thing to terrain, turning things back into jungles and eventually creating prehistoric monsters out of them. So the question mark here thing is mostly telling you strategies for it, but it also gives you victory conditions. Moloch has Devastation, which is the one everyone has, which is just destroy the world. Conversion, conversion is Moloch's unique, and it's um, very similar to Anathas, though, which is to say you need to convert a certain number of terrain. So he needs to make enough things primitive to say, hey, it's my world again. Sublimation. Sublimation is shared by several of the old ones, and it's essentially he needs to suck all the energy out of Lemos. If he does that, he wins the game. Um, let's look at Sisyphus real quick, just he's a different type, he's ascended, and um, he's interesting because he has of mortal birth, as well as other interesting but depressive victory. He has very few direct control abilities. What he has is the ability to benefit from the way of the world's working, both his origin questions and also dealing with the chosen one. So he gets abilities based on how he wants the he wants the approval, he wants to corrupt the chosen one, he also wants to recover his historic artifacts to help him ascend. Uh, and the other thing is he imbues agents, so he has very little direct ability to influence the world, but he can make his agents much more powerful and give them extra abilities, and they can go out and do his whim. He's a uh, medium difficulty. And let's go ahead with Karth, everyone's favorite. Prime. He's a primal. Um, his abilities, he has one that's pretty straightforward, War Without End, all sorts of war-based abilities. His other ones are orc abilities. So War Without End, Bloodlust, all military conflicts where an agent or orcs are present will result in greater casualties. When you have orcs, and especially when you can raise a ton more with his other ability tree, it just makes sense you want to just keep throwing them and create more casualties. With Bloodlust, especially when it gets stronger, even um, highly armored heavy, heavy infantry will take some casualties no matter what. Call the Horde, this is how he brings back his orcs and also goblins and ogres, other goblinoids. So Awaken the Tribes, this is, he could use that for a different strategy with Karth, which is interesting. You can um, spawn them anywhere on the map, so you can just choose a place and spawn a goblin, orc, or ogre. Sometimes other things as well. And you can do that to kind of distract the world and give them a bunch of different challenges all around so they don't turn around and focus on you. So yeah, let's just jump ahead. And jump, jump right into the um, uh, the choice f um, for um, the scenario. So what you see here is the question here, blood without, this is actually Karth special. So darkness gave way to light and then to blood, fire and carnage. The world was as it should be, but the weak did not welcome your gift, your gift of war. With a bright blade they took your eye and your blood now runs to the world. What lesson did war teach you? And you pick. And um, so you're looking at Vendetta. Nails are strong, but they would fall before you. So Vendetta is saying that you spent the rest of your life just killing elves because you were so mad they took your eye out. Seems like something that a primal of war would do. So if you go with the question mark, you will see the actual numbers. Elder race awareness plus 10%, that's bad. Elf awareness growth plus 50%, that's really bad. That's saying that they're essentially going to, they're almost guaranteed to at some point discover you. Lithoriel is the elven emperor, he'll hate you. Here's the big good one for you. Elf population minus 50%. Every elf POI starts with half population, which is a pretty big deal. 
Doors of Minotaurs also go down a bit. Primal Bane Artifact Chance plus 10%, that's not good for you. Primal Bane Artifacts will kill Karth very quickly. You generally have to avoid fights when you see that. Or send your agents in. It also adds a few events. Um, oh, this one's good. An eye for an eye. Um, oh, at the bottom also you're seeing names. Most of these do not give new names. This is giving you <clears throat> Zulzant, for instance, an elven title. These are more names that can discover you. So choosing here also has that effect as well. But an eye for an eye is you, you steal the eye from another primal and you get the eye of Galmog. You get officer level infiltration any military battle anywhere on the map. It's very strong for Karth. It synergizes very well with his abilities. But let's just use the midday. Uh, before the fall. So you see it stocks up here on the left. You, the quotes pop up every so often in some of these. There's a randomization for it. <clears throat> but each one comes from the appropriate age or background. Ooh, mass and urine race. Let's see. And we'll just jump through these. Civil War. Notice that there's things start gluing on here uh, as you choose them. Uh, and so you go through it. This one is probably one of the most important because this is what happens right at the end. And that loads the map. And then press the button to play, which we will do next time. So please do come back for our first 10 turns of a game. We will be doing that. And then a bunch of turns in the middle of a game. And then finally the end game. Thank you very much.